it's a very complicated machine and you know both ideologically practically economically social structures and, and so forth that we're trying to change we invited all animal advocates from around the world to explore important and complex topics through respectful solution-based dialogue we attempt to find common ground welcome to the third and final part of our campaign episodes at this point we'd already completed our two-hour uh, recording and things started to wind up a little bit. Some of those who joined us even refer to it as a bit of a tussle. That last bit seemed to be against your own position about pressure campaigns, I thought. I don't think my argument is counter to what I, I talk about. So I'd like to think of this as a bit of a bonus episode, and so much of it was too good to cut, so it is going to be a bit longer, but I think you'll find that it's worth it. With that, let's get into it. As animal advocates, we want to advance the plight of our fellow animals as fast as possible. But what about the overall strategy, and how do our tactics fit into this? What campaign should we be dedicating our limited time to? Are we winning? I know one thing that's really helped me is to kind of stop asking that question. I think maybe this is largely a personality thing, but I, I guess for me, I look at the, the Coliseum took, what, around 400 years? To, to reverse that. So when I look at my role that I play in the animal movement, I like to think of you know my small section of time that I'm in it. And to me, it's not a matter of winning in any, any individual demo or even in my lifetime. I think just being mindful of that big picture, but not becoming too overly focused on it because I've done that in the past and it's quite upsetting to not get that immediate gratification. Because I think if we go back to that burnout um, poll we asked, you know, if people are leaving because they're not seeing change, well, I, th I think that's normal. I think with these large social movements, I mean, several people here can speak to social movement theory. I mean, we've, we've got to have the big picture in perspective. I mean, the whole exp expression, you know, animal liberation in one generation, I think it's great. It gets motivation, but I'm just not sure that's where our focus should be from a, a keeping things realistic. I've just got a few um, things that concern me, I suppose, a lot at the moment, and I've been taking a, as we spoke about earlier, been taking a break myself a little bit, well, especially during lockdown, but just reassessing where I spend my time. But one thing that really troubles me is with a lot of the things that are going on in the movement, are we actually saving other animals, given that especially, for example, animal agriculture uh, subsidized so heavily and, and bail out as well. And I know, um, in uh, the US, I don't know how it works in the, in the UK actually, but in the US they stockpile other animals rather than reduce the breeding. So even if veganism was increasing, which actually there are no signs that it's, it's increasing great over there, um, it isn't actually bringing down the number of other animals that are being bred for, for the use in the industry. So that really concerns me. Also, someone mentioned earlier about the, the sabbing, um, not pushing the movement, but at least here we, ha we can have a direct impact on saving individual lives. So I feel that that is still really important because we're, we're talking about individuals. We, I think sometimes we can get lost in the number, but you know, if we can save an individual's life, that's really important and I wouldn't want that to be lost. Um, and also another thing that I feel is millions of other animals are being used right now to find a vaccine for for COVID on top of the usual use. And yet it seems vivisection and, and animal testing is being largely ignored by the movement um, in, in normal times, but even, even now. And then another thing that concerns me is, is will we get a big increase in veganism? Well, while ever the dominant culture is so speciesist, that carnism is the norm, and we're breathing, you know, we're living and breathing this toxicity um, and people are so heavily influenced by their environment, it takes a lot to actually go against the grain. So, you know, you're, you're going against your family, often your friends, your peers. We heard from Dan earlier how, how difficult that is. So it seems it's, it's a quite an ask to get people to actually go vegan. So these are just the things I don't have any answers. I'm just raising these concerns that I have. Um, and it, it feels to me that we have to work on individuals, but we have to work on systems and we have to work from all angles. So education, but also I think we need to be more political as individuals, but also as a movement. I feel like we've kind of lost the political angles that maybe we had back, say, um, you know, in the early days of activism and, and Roger's Day and people, other people on here. So they're, they're my thoughts. I'd love to hear other people's views on all of that. 
Yeah, I just wanted to follow on from something Wendy said. Um, it's use of the language, uh, this is a bit of a tangent to be honest. It's um, use of the language of saving animals. Um, we hear it a lot in the movement. We have these calculators where if you put in how many years you've been vegan and it generates the number of animals you've saved. And I think these are beyond problematic. I'm not sure if we're allowed to swear on this show, but they really anger me. Because um, not only do they give this false sense that we are winning, when someone goes vegan, no animals are saved. Wendy's talking about sabs. By intervening in the hunts and protecting those foxes or whatever species it might be, they literally are saving lives. Or when you liberate someone from a lab or a farm, you're literally saving a life. But just because someone changes their consumer habits, there's no animal saved there. Animals haven't magically been freed from their enslavement. And I, I would say that sparing is a more accurate word. Um, but even then, that's it's kind of hard to, to say that as well, especially with subsidies and bailouts, as, as uh, Wendy said there. Have the big victories that our movement has won, for instance, banning the animals who are used in circuses or banning fur farms in several countries, been effective in introducing the concept of animal rights? The, the, the circus things um, can do, uh, but the interesting thing about that is that, that this really highlights the um, difference between rights and welfare in a sense, that, that because if the, if the activists are presenting an animal rights case, the, the circus usually, you know, we, quite a lot of us here have probably had this experience where the first thing the circus say, well, the RSPCA or the ISPCA have, have um, inspected the farm and everything's grand. So they always translate rights into welfare. It, it, it is it is possible um, it is possible to to present an animal rights message and the best thing to do there would be to have a consistent one and there is some interesting work uh, by a guy called um, Richard Gale and he's a sociologist and usually we talk about the movement and the counter movement but there is this interesting thing about the movement and the counter movement and then the state or the state agency so it's not a dyad two thing, it's a triad three thing. And um, if the animal rights people create enough social turbulence through media or disruptions or through actions, then what tends to happen is the state will contact the, you know, the, the animal use industry in question. And if that's the circus, for example, that will get translated into welfare. We, we can actually afford to concentrate on animal rights because the animal welfare will, is in a sense, take care of itself. Because that's the only way the system can respond to animal rights, is through translating it down to animal welfare. The ban on the fur farms are quite controversial in my view. Um, I've been quite critical of them because I don't think activists who bring them about really appreciate what's going on. It seems to me that uh, what tends to happen is when you close a fur farm down, no one is saved then in terms of the welfare, if that's an issue for people, and often it is, then the welfare is liable to get worse because they, the other animals are transferred to China or Russia, for example, and everybody complains that they don't have any, any welfare. And we can argue about whether that's even relevant. And then the third issue is that the, the fur farmers who you've closed down become multimillionaires. And the activists have called these people animal abusers for years whilst closing them down. If you make an animal abuser into a multimillionaire, what are they going to do with that? They're not going to open a tofu farm, presumably. So um, there is some, some kind of structural problems with bans uh, in that sense. You know, and the, the fur thing in particular is, seems to be extremely problematic. I, I once asked somebody who was very prominent in the English fur ban. And um, if we could have a kind of tactical conversation. And he was saying to me, no, we, we couldn't do it. The movement wouldn't tolerate it because we need these victories. You know, kind of psychologically, we need, we need the kind of victory. So it's as though we're not sophisticated enough, really, in a sense, to, to, to have that kind of um, conversation. You know, but I don't think, I don't think the bands often do what, what is written on the tin. You know, they, I mean, it's claimed, for example, that more foxes are killed now in England, Scotland, and Wales, than before the before the the hunt ban, you know, 
there's a, there's a hunt ban in Ireland on one on one particular hunt, a deer hunt, and they're they're still they're still killing. You know, so but bans within a species society are not necessarily everything they're cracked up to be. Can you talk a little bit more about how every fur farmer becomes a multimillionaire? Yeah, because they get compensation. So but they're all getting millions and millions of dollars. Yes. Every fur farmer. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I was a, a kind of, when I was doing my PhD, I was a kind of consultant for a series that was out called Beastly Business. And it was, set, it was cut into three films. And one of them was about, um, partly at least to do with the fur trade. A lot, a lot of that film has disappeared now. I don't, I don't know where it is. It's, it's not appeared on, on the internet that you'd expect you to. But there is a section where there's a, there's a guy, a fur farmer from Britain with a bit of a comedy name called Michael Cobbledick. And uh, he was one of the fur farmers who were closed down. And at the time of the, um, of the filming, he, w- he, he was uh, in line to get something like eight million pounds worth of compensation. Um, they, actually took, they actually took the British government to the European Court of Human Rights in a kind of ironic way uh, because they wanted 21 uh, million pounds uh, split between all the fur farmers. Uh, and also, in the film, Cobbledick almost said thank you to the government for expanding his fur interests in mainland Europe. So, because it takes a long time to get these bands, he was able to set up in main, main, mainland Europe with a bigger set of farms. And not only that, he was able to bring the pelts back to Britain because that bit wasn't banned. It was only the growing of the, of the minks that wasn't allowed. So he ended up with a bigger farm in mainland Europe, and then he ended he ended up with um, still doing the pelts, and he also ended up with his share of this twenty one uh, million um, pounds. And in terms of the Irish ban, which has followed the model of the English ban, I've seen estimates that the compensation will be between twelve and something like sixty million euros. But that per farmer. No, that was between them. But also, I think... How many farms are there? Well, a bit less now. I think, I think when that estimate was being made, there was about five mink farms and one fox farm. Now there's only three mink farms left. So th- that conversation will be, will be less. But they all still will become multimillionaires. I, I, think, it's, I think it's important to remember Beastly Business came out in the 90s. Um, that was 20 something or maybe not 90s but like late 90s uh, early 2000s so that was 20 years ago um i also don't think that's necessarily commonplace as to what happens when bans happen in the fur industry um i don't think that's necessarily what's happened, happened in the last like one Jake. sweden no what's Nor- that norway the last one that happened there as well in fact actually there's a slight difference now instead of because the compensation costs so much the governments have come up with a new idea. Rather than giving them a bulk compensation, they will say to them, you can stay open for another 12 years or another nine, 10 years. Okay. Um, but I, I, think that's a, I think that's just one point of the, of the discussion, though. I think, I think the, a, a bigger thing is that the more that we keep these industries on the run, the more that they have to continue to run. And it becomes harder and harder for them to make profit. And it becomes harder and harder for them to, to keep going. Um, I think banning fur farms is one piece of a bigger, bigger picture on how to destroy the fur industry. I think we've done a pretty successful job uh, at times destroying the fur industry in a variety of different ways. But I think the idea that like, if we ban fur farms, they're just going to move to another country is, is a bit problematic. One, I think it, it indicates or implies that there aren't movements in those places that they're moving to that we don't rely on or, or believe that can win. Um, and, and that's not really believing in our movement, which I, I think I have a bit of a, a pushback on. And I think the second piece is the alternative is that we educate our way into people not wearing fur and in turn these fur farms start to close down. I'm assuming, you know, that's the alternative. Um, but I think the response to that is you educate people about the fur industry and people stop wearing fur it might slow things down, but it might slow things down in, in, you know, countries like the United States or Ireland or England that also pushes the fur industry and pushes those fur farms into other places around the world. So the idea that education has this 
magical effect where the industries just collapse and shut down and then nothing pops up in their place or in terms of veganism, like vegan com companies pop up in their place. It's just not how the world works. Like there's going to be phase outs, regardless if you win through, through pressure campaigning or through strictly educational outreach. Um, but either way, you're going to be driving people and their money and their business to other places. You can get all the McDonald's in the world to shut down. It just means everyone's going to go to Burger King and Wendy's. It doesn't mean that veganism wins and, and the animals win. It's just that we're shifting things around. Um, but I think the point is that if we can shift things around fast enough and big enough that these industries feel like they're on the run all the time and it's easier to close and stop doing what they're doing, I think we're better off. Yeah. Um, well, you said, said a lot there. Is, uh, that last bit seemed to be uh, against your own position about pressure campaigns, I thought. But um, it seems to me, uh, as, a gen as a general matter, in, in relation to if the demand doesn't go down, then if, you, if the supply side is winning, it means that the, the chess pieces are just moved around the board. And in, in relation to this issue that, you know, all activists have said to me over the years, well, you know, if you close them down here and they go there, we'll go there as well. The, o the only issue about that is that with the English ban, then mainland Europe w was where the other animals were transferred to. Uh, now, when the mainland Europe farms have been closed down. It's China and Russia where they've been uh, transferred to. And in relation to the campaigning going there, the, the, the campaigners and the Chinese animal campaigners are absolutely brilliant. They do, they do some absolutely marvelous things, you know, despite all the racism that they get fr fr from our end of the world. But the, um, the problem is that their campaigning environment is a lot more restricted than ours. So we're, we're actually putting all the problem with the people who have got the kind of hardest work. And that doesn't seem to be kind of fair in a way to, 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 to me, because, you know, it is true. We can chase them all around the world, but you know, are all, are all the, are all the anti-fur people going to up sticks and go to Russia and China in order to finish the job off? I think not. No, of course not. But I also think that just to go back to your, your suggestion that I'm countering my own argument, um, I think educational outreach is critically important, but I think it's critically important when used as part of a pressure campaign. And I think we agree on that. Yeah. Um, of course, we want people to stop wearing fur and eating animals and, and, and using animals in all sorts of ways. But I think we can do that as part of a pressure campaign and, and get a two for, you get two for one. Um, so I don't think my argument is counter to what I, I talk about. Um, that being said, like I, like, I do think that we are underestimating the people that are in these countries. Of course, we, we're not all going to pick up and move to China and Russia to fight the fur trade. Um, but I do think that speaks to the importance of having a unified and, and larger grassroots or, uh, movement where we are in this together and we can learn from one another and have big conversations and talk to one another and grow with one another. And we can support them the way that they can support us. I mean, you can look at, you know, even Russia in the mid 2000s, you had activists raiding laboratories, burning equipment, um, raiding fur farms, liberating animals um, in Russia. Um, and as you said, there's amazing activists in China doing loads and loads of work. Um, so, so I also think that our movement is incredibly small and, and hopefully it will grow and become bigger and bigger. But I, I just think the idea that like, we would rather keep fur farms in our countries and in, in, in our, in our countries because we have better, I don't, I don't understand even that argument. Like, we have better ways to fight them or we want to keep them around because they, they have better welfare on their farms or I, I just don't, I, I guess I don't understand even the argument of like why we would want to keep these places operational and what the alternative is if it's not to shut them down and it's not to keep them open. It's simply to change people's minds and hopes that they don't buy the stuff anymore. It's just mm. as much of like a, a, a pie in the sky idea as like getting 20, 30, 40, 50% of the world to go vegan in hopes that like it ends all animal agriculture overnight. It's just a bit of a fallacy in my opinion. Check. Can I jump in real quick, Roger? Of course. Um, I was just curious, Jake, a bit of a clarifying question because I, I feel it, you know, obviously focusing more on so-called fur. And I'm just curious, do you think that something like fur that has less social acceptance, if perhaps that's, you, we're gonna employ, employ different tactics? than necessarily standing outside of big chains for other animals who are raised, you know, their bodies and 
secretions and the rest of it are raised for dietary purposes, that's more widely accepted. Do you think there's almost a phased approach that these things like fur maybe tilt more towards the pressure campaign side and demoing outside of you know, local businesses that still sell it because we can kind of focus on, in on them more so than maybe some of the other ones? Or do you think more kind of universally we should shift towards pressure campaigns in general? I think tactically, you, you adjust your tactics and strategies based on wh what your target is and the situation that they're in. I think the fur industry, as, as I think we've seen through the 80s and 90s, was decimated strictly through, really, through direct action, uh, underground economic sabotage, liberations, and hard-hitting um, protest. Um, so I think that like, it's different for everything. But I think, I think the fur industry is, well, it's not like, on the brink of closing. I think it's more on the ropes than anything, like the most of the things that we fight against. And I think like we've seen that if you give them a, a solid push, um, they are teetering. And I think, um, yeah. So I think, I think, again, I advocate for using any tactic that's smart and strategic. Um, but I, I think with the fur industry, like we've seen what's worked in the past for whatever reasons, like in certain countries, it just wasn't finished off. And we can, that's a much bigger discussion, in my opinion, between grassroots and national organizations who just kind of gave up on fur because it was, it was done. Um, you know, and we can point fingers at PETA and so forth and so on. But um, I, I do think that like there are industries like the fur industry that if there was a solid push that's strong and, and based on a lot of smart tactics and strategies and histories, I think like it could have a pretty big impact pretty quickly. And I so use we could quickly, almost relative. <laughs> so for lack of a better term, it's almost, we could almost look at it like a hierarchy of animal use and target those ones that are not socially accepted widely, like fur. And then once that's done, move on to the next one, or you, do you think spread out and focus on? No, I, I wouldn't use the word of a better term. I wouldn't use the word hierarchy because I think that implies a, a, a bit of like a speciesist uh, ideology. But I do think like, it's it, for a movement our size and with our ability, if we're going to be honest about all of that, I think we need to attack what's most strategic for us to attack. And yes, like we want to start campaigns that will just destroy the animal agriculture industry. But I think the reality is like, that's going to be much more difficult for a movement that doesn't have a, a, a large number of people and a large number of, ex, of, of experienced organizers. And we talked about theory of change earlier, frankly, lacks a theory of change. Um, uh, we need to pick realistic targets. And I think Elle talked about that earlier as well. Like we need to pick realistic targets that we are capable of moving. And then we learn from them and we grow from them. And I know I always talk about the Shack campaign and everyone hates hearing about it, but I think that's a great example of how folks in England started with the breeder campaigns, started out relatively small, moved bigger and bigger and bigger with more and more experience, more and more people um, to start taking on really large organizations and corporations. Um, and we, that's obviously like a whole other conversation. Um, I, I, I don't disagree with Roger that there are problems, I think, here and there with things like bans, but I don't think there are things, that, but I don't think bans are something that we should just throw away because they don't have the immediate effect that we want them to have. I think Roger and I would probably agree with some of it is in, in the fact that I think a lot of the bans are, like he said, are done with, with welfareism uh, it, it, as the, 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 meat, the, the kind of root of, of the ban. And I don't think that's, that's a good idea. And I think Roger, maybe you and, I, you and I can find a silver lining in this conversation where that, I think we agree on that. Um, I do think, you know, we t this happened, came up very early in the conversation in, in that people talk, uh, someone was talking about baby steps, but like we get to root our baby steps in liberation or welfare. It's up to us as organizers. And I say we root them in liberation. I say, instead of asking for bigger cages, we, we, we ask to shut these places down and, and have to be done forever. There, there is a, there is a lot that we agree on, Jake, uh, uh, as 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 you know, and um, you know I, I wouldn't disagree. It's interesting though. You you said well, you know, might be a mistake to focus it on welfare, but on that very point, it's interesting that the a lot of the people in the in the fur campaign would point out one of the problems with places like China and Russia is that they don't have any welfare regulations. Now that to me is a non-point but it's a point that they make, so it's obviously not to them, for, for them. And the interesting thing about that was the Irish minister at the time, who has moved on now, but it was, I think it's called Simon Coveney. Um, I'm sure somebody would, could, could correct me if I'm wrong. 
he actually said an interesting thing. He said, I'm interested in animal welfare. Now, obviously, a lot of people are just going to, you know, in, in our movement, are going to just laugh, laugh at him about that. But he was basically making this point. If you move, if you move the, the fur farms out of Ireland, then there's nothing I can do for, for those mink then. But there is whilst they're still here, and I'm interested in, in their welfare. If you send them to places where they're not interested in their welfare, then that, in a sense, he was claiming, is putting them into, into a, a worse situation. But I didn't say I'd rather them stay in Ireland. I want, I want them closed down 12 years ago, um, like, ev like everything else. And so, you know, no, no, no animal advocate would say we, we would rather them ha have it. It's just, it's almost like the implication of the, in of the an analysis of the entire thing, that if you take seriously these welfare claims, uh, then you are sending sending them to the worst places, and also the worst places. I mean, I agree with you that I I mean I didn't underestimate the activists in Russia or in China. In fact, I I bigged them up like 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 you did. But I think it's a little bit rich for us to burden them even worse, given that they're in a very difficult campaigning environment, and also their countries are incredibly punitive when it comes to punishment. It's not as though you know. I mean, some British um, advocates would say that you know the British prison system is is like a holiday camp. I know you wouldn't say that about the United States um, version of that. But to act, to actually then kind of get all those activists to risk their liberty in a place like that, compared with with ourselves, just seems to be a bit of a almost cruel in a way. But well, so what is the what is the answer that I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up so much space, but I, I am curious to what your answer is to the fur situation. What would you have liked to seen in I happen in Ireland around the fur well, industry? We've, we've got to decimate the demand side. Otherwise they'll just move it around. And, and what they, happens if they don't, if they can't make money in Ireland anymore? You just said they moved to other countries in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you, if you, if you're saying that, um, yeah, I mean, it is true. If all the demand ends up being in China and, and, and Russia too, then, then th yes, that's the problem. I, I, so the outcome I, is the same regardless of how we do it. Well, no, because we're, I mean, like our, all of us here are probably thinking that we're probably going to be able to, through campaigning of a, a variety of means, are going to be able to have an effect either on the supply side or the demand side. And like we all dream and hope and, and we aspire to, um, ending, ending the demand for animal use, uh, but you know that's that's the ultimate thing we've got to do. Otherwise, if we focus on the on the supply side, they will just move it around. Because if the demand is still there, they'll meet it. If the demand is not there, that destroys them. That requires us to to reduce the demand drastically on a global yeah. scale, and I think yeah, we got, yeah, we, the, the, I think that's where we 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 part ways in that that is just not a realistic strategy, in my opinion, um, at least one that happens any time in our lifetimes. Um, well, maybe I'm more optimistic than you, Jake. Well, clearly, I'm, <laughs> that's why I enjoy talking to you. You instill maybe a little bit of optimism in me, and I love the way you bring me down every time. So, <laughs> well, I, I think I've got about. 30 questions off the back of that exchange. I mean, that's a big question to me. Can we do pressure campaigns in Russia and China? I mean, it brings us to our discussion last week about the entanglement of human rights with animal rights. You know, something that may work in Ireland, if we look at these other countries, I mean, I, I started living vegan in Singapore. I couldn't, I mean, very limited as far as what I could do publicly. So I, I, I can't help but wonder if, if, if I'm kind of leaning towards what Roger's saying, if we're shifting these to these lower welfare situations, into these countries and, and great activists there, they do what they can, but we all know how the state suppresses activism. So, especially in certain countries. So is it really realistic to say, we'll, we'll, we'll address it there once it gets there, or is that actually maybe a, a, a stopping point where we can't move further? To me, I'd rather talk about the whole issue. I think when we put all the pressure on fur in a certain country, as long as those people are still instilled with cultural speciesism, I think we're missing the big piece of the puzzle. And that's why I come back to demand. Okay, so, so what's to say that we, can't shift the, that we can't shift both at the same time? I guess if, if we I, can decimate the fur industry, where we can, where we can get, you know, if we're just gonna go pie in the sky, like, like you know, long-term craziness, like what's to say that we can't decimate the fur industry by 80% if it, it, and it gets pushed into places like Russia or China and that's what's left. 
And then, you know, there's at that point we kick in like much stronger issues around um, issues around uh, the demand side. I mean, if, if you decimate a, a, a industry by 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, that in itself is a bit of a, of a demand, a strategy around demand because it's just not going to be visible as much. I think part of that, you know, I, I wasn't around the eighties obviously. So, I mean, I can't say for sure, but it's, you know, from everything I've read and looked into about the fur industry in the eighties was that there just wasn't a lot of it around. It was something that people didn't want to be involved in. It was, it was something that people didn't want to wear partly because it wasn't as visible. You know, you got, those pressure campaigns to get the corporations and the industry, the fashion uh, companies to stop doing uh, and promoting it um, in their lines. You got, you know, people like, or, or situations like Operation Bite Back in, in the early 90s in, in the United States where people raided uh, fur farms and, and fur laboratories and fur distributors and, and auction houses very strategically and, and decimated, uh, decimated it that way through direct action using liberations and arson and economic sabotage. You had, you know, protests and civil disobedience. You had even shaming on the street, the whole thing with throwing blood, you know, paint on, on people's fur coats. All those things, you know, not only just damaged them economically, but it also affected the demand side because it just wasn't as visible as much. It wasn't, you know, it was a taboo thing. And I think if you decimate the fur industry by banning fur farms, for instance, and again, I'm not, you know, this is just off the top of my head, but if you ban fur farms in, in three quarters of the world, it, yeah, it will get pushed to the, that final quarter of the world to, to, to potentially thrive or potentially not. But when you decimate a company or industry that much, it's just not going to be as visible anymore in, 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 in the public sphere. And I think it, that in itself is, is affecting the demand. And I'm certainly no expert in this. These are just things I'm coming up with off the top of my head. I could be right. I could be wrong. I, I, I disagree with Jake there when, when he says that, um, you know, 50%, getting people to go 50% 50, 50 of the world to go vegan does not achieve or even 80, 90%. Uh, it's totally achievable because these farmers are all, like we talked about earlier, they're getting huge subsidies. I hear on the news here in Ireland lately, one of the ministers was on saying that the beef farmers aren't making money now. And they're getting 60 and 70% of their income as subsidies. And the same with dairy farmers in Ireland and all of Europe up until three years ago, they were all losing money. You know, it's only now, we, we, you know, they're selling milk all, all over the world, but that will collapse as well. But, you know, milk was always up and down, dairy was always up and down. But beef, Ireland is in the Northern Hemisphere, is the largest export of beef in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, maybe some people don't know that, but uh, it, definitely all the all these farms will will collapse if these subsidies are, are cut. You know, gradually cut and cut. You know, they they can't survive because, and then then if more and more people will start going vegan, and, and we can show what's happening to these animals. Like people are going to change, definitely. Like, like it can happen very fast if, if if we all keep putting in such a, you know a big effort into it. But you know, like like the, the whole world, the, the, you know, the, the planet depends on things changing. You know, like with the, with with the global warming. And everything. So, like 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 it has to change because it, it, it it's really horrendous and it's unsus unsustainable. Like like that, they, they, that that's the truth of, of the whole thing. You know that they're only being propped up at the moment. So it's very easy to take to take money away from these farmers. You know if we if we get some more momentum going, you know, totally achievable. Yeah. So uh, so um, it's not really a question, but more a statement. Is that there are so many questions you could ask on the last half an hour. But I think most importantly is that these conversations that are the most important are the ones that aren't happening in the mainstream. So for example, there's 50 or 60 people here, which is great, but fundamentally the masses of mainstream are more interested in having a conversation about the latest fucking, sorry, the latest vegan capitalist burger from McDonald's. And that's, and that's just the point. I think these conversations are the ones that we have to engage in because you can, you, can, um, you can go against something and you can be critical and it doesn't mean you have to have the answer. I'm often critical, but don't have the answer. And the problem is people say, well, what's the answer then? Tell me what to do. But that's not the point. It's engaging in these conversations that are going to make us 
more well adversed in how we move forward. And, and even now you can see people are talking, there's difference of opinions, but fundamentally, if we have the conversations, we might actually get to a point where we do agree and we can go forward as an actual movement. And if we've got a, if we've got the right strategy and tactic and people see that and it's explained to them, maybe we can move forward. And there's something that Pamela always talks about is a scattergun approach. If we can take away the scattergun and have it direct and focused, maybe we can actually bring more people on board. And as an example, we talk about building bridges and you look at what's going on in America at the moment. I've seen a whole host of posts today that are actively using certain imagery from the protest to fit a vegan agenda. And fundamentally, it's inciting racial hatred. But if we actually were more thoughtful about this and how we can actually reach them, if we've got a more focused approach, maybe they will be willing to join because we can find the intersections between both. And yeah, just, it's really just how do we empower this movement and, and get more people on board? Because that's what we need. We need numbers to make these campaigns and focus groups and as a collective moving forward focused or more focused. And I hope so many. I just wanted to focus on this, to just reach out and to find together the, the knowledge with the youngness, with the power, with, we have to tell a mixture of everything and just coming together. <laughs> Even I have activists 80 years old, they come into my vigil, but I'm not sh ashamed to ask them for advice and to ask them for some issues or some experiments or some, yeah. I don't know if you see the, the issue, but we have to work together. Old jobs, nice jobs, new jobs, the future is there, of course, but all together we can manage it. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to Roger and Jake's disagreements on fur animal exploitation in Ireland, because I think Jake might have said it, but um, like kind of like that it's disrupting the, the demand, but it's also kind of like disrupting uh, like exploiters in Ireland and politicians as well. Like I feel like uh, the fur industry in Ireland was kind of like their little baby, and when they got that taken away, it you know it it it's impacted them. It's like shook them because there is a win. I I kind of get that uh, they've lost in that sense. So that in that in that in itself is powerful, and that echoes throughout the the kind of exploiter industries uh, in Ireland, and also. I think I kind of more so agree with Jake, sorry, Roger, um, on this, that it's like, if, we, if they are going to move to China or Russia, then we need, we need to be supporting, as I said in the chat, um, we need to be supporting like anti or um, like trans people, gay people, LGBT people in Russia and helping them or anarchists in Russia, or we need to be helping, we need to be like, directly funding and supporting the anarchists in China who are trying to establish democracy and stuff like that. We need it. That's, I think it, as I said in the chat, it emphasizes that we need to support like other liberation movements in order for animal liberation and for and minks and foxes and stuff. I, like, I think a ban, I don't think, I don't think banning bans speciesism at all. I don't think people now view minks as people. I just think, I think banning is a tactic that we can use to help whoever they are. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd actually agree with your first point, uh, Willow. Um, I think it is, it does kind of shake up the system. And, um, you know, but that, but that goes for everything. You know, I, mean, I, th I think uh, street education is um, a pressure campaign against cultural speciesism. So, you know, we, we are... Um, you know, part of the great refusal. We're refusing what is. Just by being there, we're disrupting the normal because not normal is violent. So yeah, I can see that point, um, you know. And, um, but I just, wonder, I just wonder whether all the, um, the effort and money put into the, to the supply side of it, if that was put into the demand side, maybe. Because you see, ultimately that's the win for me because you, you take away their power by taking away their, their market. 
and we are in a kind of market economy, you know, and they can't do anything about that. I mean, they can't save themselves by going anywhere if no one will buy their stuff. Although I do, I do accept Jake had a, a point about obviously there's going to be some places in terms of demand that are going to be difficult to campaign in as well. I, I, I get that. I mean, you know, no, nothing is easy in that sense. I do take that point that, uh, you know, any kind of, um, again, I would call it turbulence, any kind of, you know, anti-species turbulence, it would be good for uh, wh wherever it comes from, because it just shakes things up and it kind of puts them into a, a difficult situation. I, I understand that. I, I would just favor the demand side personally. In a capitalist system, if people aren't buying so-called fur or, you know, hair to use a, non, a less speciesist term, what are they spending that money on? Are they using it to buy skin, you know, from a cow or a pig or, you know, so-called wool or, you know, hair from sheep? You know, where is that money going? And to Will's, Will, to your point, I mean, if, if it doesn't ban speciesism, where is that money going? Are we actually fixing the problem or to Roger's point, are we moving it around? That's what I keep asking myself. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, as you said, it doesn't um, ban speciesism. But then I suppose if it's done in a non-speciesist way, then it's okay. Um, I don't know. I think if we're like using non-speciesist language and being non-speciesist in our campaigning, then it's okay. I think reading like Joan Donaire kind of cleared that up for me in that you can still, like I think we've already established the point that you can still campaign for specific issues and be anti-speciesist in the campaigning, but yeah. First of all, thanks for especially the last half an hour discussion. It's been actually really super interesting. Um, so my first point is um, to you, Roger. I'm not convinced uh, that in a capitalist system that um, you know the consumers' needs really have all that much power to change things. I think very often um, the kind of amorphous concept that we've internalized as our consumer needs is is in fact a tool that's used to kind of sub, you know subdue and, and control us. I think it's manufactured is what I'm saying, just like most things are in, in a capitalist society. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I stand on the street and do outreach as much as I can, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to, to downplay the critical importance of, of, of public education. I think it's, it's fundamental, especially you know, in schools and, and so forth as well. Um, but that, yeah, if we, if we only tackle that side, um, I, I'm afraid that that's, that's kind of giving in to actually the way the system is, is in, indeed dominating us and, and manipulating us. Um, my bigger point, however, was to come back to your earlier disagreement, or not disagreement, but kind of um, tussle on uh, the fur farm issue, which I felt at the time, um, like I have really sympathy for both cases, but I feel that it might actually kind of bring to light one of the problems that often gets in the way of um, motivating more people to join the movement to Al's point, I think, um, which I fully fully take, right? We need to get people on side. We need to get people motivated. See, for me, the way I look at it is that um, it's a very complicated machine and, you know, both ideologically, practically, economically, social structures and, and so forth that we're trying to change. I think most of us in this discussion right now are, are kind of on, on the same page that, you know, that the issue is with the system as much as it is with speciesism, however you want to describe that, or with the, you know, with the people's choices and their lifestyle. Um, and there really simply isn't an easy kind of path between problem and solution very often. So we can't say with any kind of clean efficacy that you can um, shut down the whole fur industry very easily. And um, Roger, you're completely right. I believe that, yeah, the problem will shift to a place which is probably less well adapted from a legislative perspective to deal with it. And that sucks really badly. But on the other hand, we can't let these industries continue here either, um, to Jake's point. And I, and I think that for me, I mean, I've, it's only been a year I've actually been kind of getting into activism. I've only been vegan for three years myself, but um, I, I really see it as a very messy puzzle where very often we do have to kind of take this, this flatter gun approach, um, well directed as much as possible. But often I think we can start to demotivate people if we can't come up with compelling, well-rounded strategies. I, I used to work in business, so I'm kind of, you know, I've got these models in my head and it just doesn't apply. In this case, it simply won't apply, I think. And I don't know what the answer to that is, and I don't mean to sound cynical. I think there are, it's really important that we find ways to motivate and, and, and you know, grow the movement, but at the same time being realistic that it's, there's, there's no control in this. There simply isn't. Like, people have to take phenomenal risks, to, you know, Pamela's point earlier, and you know, Jake's kind of life story as well. Um, and, and that will happen sometimes, and other times it won't. People will be less inclined to that, but that there's just no one roadmap that we can necessarily yeah, get people on board with. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, I agree with a lot of what you've said. And in fact, I, I said myself, you know, there's, no, there's no one size fits all. And um, there's no, you know, so it's not it's not a question of, of everything in 
in one basket type situation. We we need we need we do need to approach things from lots of different angles. Uh, that 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 was never kind of part of of, of, of what I, w I was saying really. But um, I think that you know the general take out for me anyway from what you said is that we need to develop uh, critical thinking within the movement. We need to develop uh, an anti-capitalist uh, thrust in in the movement. We need to question consumerism as a general matter, not least for the environment and everything else. We, we need to forge a, a radical mindset shift. If, if we're going to save other animals, but also if we're going to save the planet mm. and if we're going to save, you know, everyone, we're going to really need to think very hard uh, as an entire kind of world community. I mean, I'm, this is where I'm pessimistic because I don't see much of that happening. I try to be optimistic. I tried to follow Tom Reagan on that. He was an optimist. But if you, if, I mean, even just watching what's going on with the, the, the pandemic, it, you can get quite depressed by the irrationality of, of humanity. You know, they, they can't wait to get back into the skies and start polluting. One of the, one of the, the things that keeps um, knocking on in, in my mind uh, that I, I heard was that the oceans are really quiet now. So the whales are thriving. And the reason for that is that there's not that many boats and cruisers and all that, you know, vegan cruisers going around. Um, you know, and like they're, they're thriving because of that. But we can't wait to get back in, back there, you know, and start fecking everything up again. You know, so we do, we do have a major job, yeah. We, and um, I'm not claiming that just focusing on demand only because you, you've got to change mindsets. I go back to the vegan pioneers vegan social movement pioneers, they, they wanted to create a different way of looking at everything from a non-exploitative, non-speciesist, justice for all kind of mindset. And they thought that was the key to radical, fundamental revolutionary change. And I think they were right. How, how, how we can do that, we've been trying to talk about that, you know, the last couple of hours. But Yeah, and I was just wanting to make a point um, in relation to the whole you know, idea of what the bans actually do and needing to address speciesism at its core, because I was just thinking of um, palm oil, how this is a big thing that everyone, including vegans, have you know, started to avoid because of what's happening to orangutans and the rainforest. But a lot of people seem to think that if we ban palm oil, those exploiters are going to stop doing what they're doing. Um, when in reality, like it's like because like Iceland banned the like they don't have palm oil in any of their products, but yet they you know they have um, the secretions of other animals in loads of their products, and they, I'm pretty sure they sell animals' bodies as well. Um, but bringing it back again to what we were saying about petitions, how some people will you know they sign a petition and they feel like they've done their job. I think sometimes with bans as well, that can kind of people can feel like they've, you know, they've achieved something if they get one specific thing banned, when really it's it's only one tiny, yeah, part of the puzzle, as was mentioned as well. What's moved into the conversation latterly is, um, you know, talking about um, challenging capitalism. Now, there's been sporadic outbreaks of talking about challenging capitalism throughout the whole three hours, but it seems to be becoming more of a thing, more of a consensus amongst the people that are sort of like left in the conversation, which I think is interesting. You know, this, this comes back down to sort of like self-education and consciousness raising um, amongst vegans. And I'm wondering how we can sort of take this all forward, you know, but it would be great if we could sort of concretize it as well. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point that uh, after a country passes a ban on safe fur farms, the, the campaign isn't over. Um, they can ban import, they can ban sale, um, and further attack the, these, uh, these industries. So when the supply moves to a different country, perhaps with more repressive tactics, we could target the global market, um, not necessarily by the, by the individuals, but target the companies that are supplying it globally. And uh, as we have with the, the seal fur industry, get our countries to ban the import of it. Well, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, my general point about bans, Matt, is um, 
if you were to kind of um, juxtapose two possibilities, one, one is you you win the argument and people change, or you get something banned and people haven't changed, and now you've got a group of pissed off people who can't do what they still want to do, versus a population who've now been educated to to change culturally, then clearly the the people who who changed, you know, from our point of view and from you know in terms of social change, social change is much superior to 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 uh, achieving a, a ban and leaving a lot of people frustrated because they still want to do what they want to do. I would I would have thought that's kind of self evident. Would you? I understand that, but I think that in order to achieve the ban, you have to change the minds of a number of folks, um, and then the populace can change the minds of others. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, I just think about the the the, the hunt ban that that goes on in in Wales and Scotland and England, and um, you know, the the hunters have found every loophole possible in order to keep exploiting other, other animals and committing rights violations because they were never convinced by the argument. It seems to me that if you've got the choice of trying to bring about one outcome versus another, and one is far more superior. Yeah, um, I don't have the solution to get hunters to not want to hunt anymore, but uh, preventing them from doing so could have... Uh, yeah. Touché, as we say. Yeah, you, you, Good point, yeah. Uh, Roger, I wanted to respond directly to something you said. Um, oh. And I think I've heard you say it before. Uh, this idea that if we ban something, but there's people who still want to do it, you know, they're just going to be all pissed off. Obviously, we're a long way off having legal banning of um, any sort of meat, dairy or eggs. Though I, th I, think, I think in the UK, foie gras is banned or at least to produce it, but not to import it, which is absurd. But anyway, in this future where we do finally get a ban um, on meat or dairy or eggs, even though there's still going to be a large percent of the population who still want to eat it, I uh, like. are they really going to be that pissed off? Because for me, most people, they just, buy, they just buy and eat what's in front of them. They'll go into the supermarket and just, oh, okay, I'll put that in my basket. Like, I don't think, maybe this is a bit naive or harsh of me, but I don't think most people are kind of consciously thinking that much about what they eat. If meat, dairy and eggs aren't on the shelf, all right, I'll just have whatever else is available. Yeah, I, I agree on, on that particular case. I agree. It's a case by case thing. It's, you know, it, it, it doesn't fit every single case. I, I agree with, with you there. I mean, interestingly, um, Jake mentioned the fact that, um, you know, there's a big, a big thing where people were throwing paint over, over fur, uh, fur coats on the street and everything, and they disappeared, you know, and the demand did go down. And um, it's interesting then because like, there's been interviews since then when, when you see the kind of re-emergence of fur in, in various different uh, ways, you know, trim and they, they kind of, you know, pr process it in different ways. A lot of people said, I, I never not wanted to have fur, but I was at one point a bit too frightened to, to have fur. And um, then they might have just done what Jeremy said, which was in that in that case, I, I, you know, for that period, I I, I transferred to some flash uh, leather uh, garment. Um, and so again, it, this problem just seems to reemerge in the sense that um, you know you you've stopped somebody doing something that they still want to do. And I but I do take the point in terms of of the um, uh, of the food then yeah, I mean, I think that most people, you know, I mean, uh, w one of my friends at uh, university um, said, you know, well, if I went into a restaurant and um, most of the things were vegan, I'd be quite happy to to, to, to eat vegan or plant-based. You, know, you know, if I had to go out of my way to find flesh, I wouldn't. So yeah, I mean, I, I agree on that, on, that, on that specific point that you made. I agree with you completely, yeah. The Roger is right about the ban on the hunt, hunting and that in England and the, and the one in Ireland. Like unless we get people to change, you know, the police won't won't uh, enforce these laws. So banning things without people, the mass, of, uh, critical mass of people changing is not great. Sorry, I just wanted to say, as like uh, not like a critique or anything, but I just love to see more 
black indigenous people of color and like more kind of marginalized voices on here as well which i'm sure you all want as well um just yeah because i see like obviously we're like more like the global north so it's like america northern europe areas i suppose but we got to get other uh other than white faces on here as well um just especially with what everything's everything that's happening in the states at the moment it'd be good to hear from black vegan voices it, it, it's a major concern of ours um i can assure you and it's something that we've talked about repeatedly it's just that so far we haven't figured out a way of of achieving it because um we we've invited lots of people and in fact a couple a couple have agreed and then pulled out or uh, you know it's, it's it's not it's not i mean it's desirable but not that easy to achieve unfortunately yeah and i assume you were wanting that as well i just wanted to... oh yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we've we've talked about the team have talked about it, not endlessly, but we've talked about it. Yeah, I, I I'm certainly in the same camp. And with that, I mean, we are a small team. So if you have promotion ideas that can help us to achieve that, like let's this isn't just about the back office staff here. This is about all of us. So like let's build like let's build these discussions together because it's going to be better if we if we do that. And with that, thanks everybody for coming. See everybody next time. So to build on Willa's point, we absolutely agree that we want to have as diverse a representation of the animal advocate community as possible. So if you can please share our events, and particularly using the Facebook invite friends feature, I think that would really help to get as many animal advocates invited to these events as possible. As always, thank you for everything you do for our fellow animals. Please leave your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one.